Dowie going in with Schmeichel. Who uh, caught it calmly and competently. Used it quickly to McClare. He was hurt, but he got the pass away to Giggs. Only Hughes in the middle. Robson trying to get there. Lovely work from Ryan Giggs. Konchelskis. Robson. Hughes has scored at Southampton's expense again. He turns to Giggs, who had a major part in the goal. Celebrations for the league leaders. Howard Wilkinson faced a hard task getting his squad ready for the trip to the capital. With Rod Wallace out, Carl Shutt was given his first start and repaid the manager's faith getting on the end of a measured Gary Speed cross to put Leeds ahead. He was clearly delighted with his goal after being out for several weeks. Dorigo was hounded by the home supporters. He almost silenced them. His cross found McAllister. Chapman's shot was brilliantly turned away by Hitchcock. Leeds pushed forward and were almost caught on the break when Graham Lasseau's cross found Dennis Wise. He put the ball past Lukic and went away to celebrate. Only to discover he'd been given offside. Teal. Atkinson lurking and has got away here from Abler to the set up Kevin Richardson and Aston Villa in front. McManaman winning the throw, which David Burrows will take. Ronnie Rosenthal. Now, as he pushed down there by McGrath, he looks to the referee and the referee points at the spot. Now, a week ago at Meadow Lane, Mark Walters scored from the spot just three minutes from time to win that match for Liverpool. He's got a chance to make a hero of himself again, and this time against the team he supported as a boy. Nigel Spick, the Villa goalkeeper, beaten, and Walters has equalised. Coventry showed their win over Arsenal last week was no fluke. Paul Furlong, a non-league player last year, got his fourth of the season against Notts County, a win which puts the Sky Blues fourth. Sheffield Wednesday were up against another of Trevor Francis's former clubs, Manchester City, and they seemed to be up against it as a whole when Niall Quinn rocketed the ball past Chris Woods. The linesman's flag for offside saved them on that occasion. City's bright start to the season had been based on three home wins and seven goals. But the gods weren't on their side when David White followed up his own initial cross and threatened to destroy the crossbar. Wednesday, remember, playing without John Sheridan and David Hurst, had their good moments too. And Gordon Watson took Roland Nielsen's pass in his stride but couldn't claim his first goal for Wednesday, thwarted by Tony Coton. The keeper, who's one of those waiting in the wings for Chris Wood's England jersey, was impressive throughout. But when Wednesday got their winner 17 minutes from time, he had a hand in it. Watson's cross, Coton palms it out, and Paul Williams stabs the ball in for the second successive Saturday. Manchester City nil, Sheffield Wednesday won. QPR still winless, were holding Tottenham goalless going into the final 20 minutes at White Hart Lane. Gary Lineker's opportunism changed all that. Jerry Francis has moved to change Rangers' fortunes by signing striker Paul Walsh on a month's loan from Tottenham. The switch came too late for Walsh to play at White Hart Lane, but he's likely to make his debut at Luton on Tuesday. Rangers look like they need him in just to lift them. Roy Wigley's back pass, gifting Lineker his second goal in four minutes. Seems a long time since QPR almost beat Arsenal on the opening day. Forrest's defence, already without Des Walker, had to make do without the suspended Stuart Pearce as well. So how would they fare against Wimbledon's barrage of awkwardness? Not very well to start with, Paul McGee scored after two minutes. The home side quickly realised that the best form of defence was attack. They shredded Wimbledon with some high quality football, Roy Keane involved at the start and finish of this move to equalise. Forrest's offensive threat has been supplemented by the signing from Luton of Kingsley Black, a player Brian Clough almost signed 18 months ago. 
Black looks as if he'll fit nicely into the Forest style. He knew exactly where to run to meet Keane's beautifully angled cross and score his first goal for his new club. Keane continues to be the man who makes Forrest tick. You can see why Clough allowed Steve Hodge to join Leeds. Scott Gemmell provided the three pass for the Irishman's second. The perfectly timed run ended with a classy finish. Wimbledon knocked flat by Forrest's football, although at least in their case it was only metaphorically. Referee Terry Lunt, by contrast, wasn't so fortunate. The man in black was in the wrong place at the wrong time as Mark Crossley attempted to start a counter-attack. Happily, Lunt was fine and quickly back on his feet as most of the players managed to keep a straight face. Stop sniggering, Brett Williams. By now, Wimbledon didn't know whether they were coming or going. Gary Crosby's pullback was relatively harmless, or at least it was until Gary Elkins tried to deal with it. Wimbledon did pull one back in the later stages. A bit of a scramble as Robbie Earl poked towards goal and Andy Clark was denied before Crosby felled John Fashionu. Fashionu, back from suspension, took the chance to mark a special anniversary, scoring 100 years to the day since the very first conversion of a penalty in the Football League. No pictures available from 1891 to tell us if it was taken as coolly as that. Crystal Palace chairman Ron Nodes apologised in the match programme for the ill-considered comments he made about black players in a Channel 4 documentary broadcast during the week. Palace perhaps not in the best frame of mind to face an Arsenal side who was starting to get their act together. Kevin Campbell held off Lee Sinnott to squeeze the only goal of the first half under Perry Suckling's dive. Suckling, making a first Palace appearance in almost two years with Nigel Martin suspended, was culpable there but blameless as the goals flowed after half-time. Arsenal were imperious. Alan Smith doubled the lead with an unstoppable header. George Graham's side begin their tilt at the European Cup on Wednesday, so it was a good time for Michael Thomas to remember how to score. Then again, he's built his reputation on scoring at the right time. This is first league goal of 1991. It could be a tough night at Highbury for Austria Vienna if Arsenal are on this kind of attacking form. Paul Merson sprinted past non-existent challenges to set up the fourth, Campbell's second of the afternoon. Plenty of attacking reasons for Graham to be optimistic then, but the defence still isn't quite as mean as it was last season. It was all too easy for Mark Bright here. He didn't falter, he didn't celebrate either. That rather sums up Palace's week. The return of Mick Harford to Kenilworth Road after a spell at Derby was always destined to make headlines. It's difficult to know if he was signing autographs before the match or writing his own script. But the early signs were that Harford was earmarked for the part of the villain. This tackle on Nick Henry after just five minutes earned him a yellow card. But from that point on, Harford set about winning over his audience. His a leading role in Luton's best chance of the first half. David Priest hitting the crossbar from 18 yards. Oldham went ahead eight minutes after half-time. Earl Barrett's cross and Ian Marshall heading beyond Alec Chamberlain. That was Marshall's fifth goal of the season and another jolt to Luton's confidence. But then a dramatic turnaround in the last five minutes. First, Matthew Jackson found substitute Kurt Nogan in the penalty area and he was able to make space for a cross which gave Harford the easiest of goals. About two feet out that one, it was hardly the making of a hero. That came with precisely 44 seconds left. Again, Kurt Nogan, the man to set up the chance, but this time the finish more spectacular. So, two goals on his return to the club and a 2-1 victory. Harford clearly a man with a sense of timing. Newman... Mark Bowen, 
They're getting players up in support, but can they get it into the box, into the danger area? Other thorn. Crook chipping it forward, and in goes Bowen, and here's Rule Fox. Great move. And once again, it's chipping Crook with that pass forward. And Rule Fox, the man who said, look, give me a chance and I'll score for you. And he's done exactly that. And George Paris is also pretty nifty in the air too. Away by Dale Gordon, but Bishop has another chance. Kenny Brown as West Ham stay in the area. And Morley with the header, hits the bar, and Mike Small puts it in. Morley with a brilliant first effort. And an easy touch-in from Mike Small. Here comes Crook, that's a nice one, to Bowen. Bowen still in there, and had Dale Gordon. Once again, it's Bowen who is coming forward from the back, and this time he sets up Dale Gordon, and Norwich regain the lead. All in all, Everton have found Bramall Lane a far from inspiring place to go, but with Peter Beardsley having a vintage run, hopes were high. Just like Varzika's cross, headed on by Keown and snapped up by the little number eight on the turn. Sheffield United, of course, the scene of Colin Harvey's last game as manager, as well as the scene of Howard Kendall's first on his return to the club last season. United's equaliser from Jamie Hoyland. Now, the most surprising feature of United's winner was its original source, P. Beardsley Esquire miscuing for once, and that caught everyone out. It was all very untidy and another deflating result. Ian Bryson got the winner, but it was all down to defending without any real conviction. The central zone in or around the edge of the penalty area rapidly becoming a jinx.